Hello, it's part 15 of OpenDog, the open source quadrupedal robot. So this project is an ongoing project where I'm now showing all of the detail. We've got as far as most of the mechanical build. We put some electronics in and did a kinematic model that means all 12 motors will stay in sync to move it in three translation axis and three rotation axis. So that's as far as I pretty much planned before I started the build and we got that far and now we've gone to trying to make it walk. So there's a lot of things that are going to happen and I'm showing all the detail and we started this in the last video. So last time we made this test rig and basically I was looking at putting absolute position feedback on the joints so that on power up we can recover from an unknown position and also in between flashing code on the master controller we don't lose those end switches so basically at the moment we home every actuator to an end switch on this stand and that's the only time it can happen and then at the moment the motor drivers can't remember that position and that's something that will happen in the O-Drive firmware which is the brushless motor driver so last time we looked at various encoders, we looked at putting pots on the joints, but the data is very jittery. So this time we're actually going to look at some better quality pots and also some digital feedback encoders and a bit of a discussion about the way forward. But before we start, just a quick ad for my merchandise. You can get Open Dog t-shirts, mugs, bags, socks and various other things with various other designs in my Teespring store and the link is in the description below. And also you can support my channel on Patreon. So have a look at patreon.com slash xrobots. And if you don't like Patreon, I also have YouTube channel membership. So just click on that join button below. There are also many other robotics projects in my channel including Robot X, the bipedal robot, and as a general channel strategy, I'm going to be doing more serious robotics. There are a few other projects thrown in there, but I've got various other plans to do more serious robotics projects this year, including a robot arm, and I looked at the gripper that I may use, even though we need to do another version, really, in the video that came out a couple of weeks ago. So it's worth pointing out again that the O-Drive positioning using the encoder is highly accurate to position that motor. The only problem I'm trying to solve is that once you reboot your master controller and you've homed your actuator, the O-Drive can't remember it's zero position so basically means every time I reflash the code in this case we're using a teensy in the robot at the moment we've got Arduinos it means I'd have to home those actuators again so probably what we will do is read the absolute position of the leg and then basically from then on use the O-Drive positioning with its closed loop control which is highly accurate and highly stable so that's really where we're going with this we may not need this at all and I'll come on to that discussion in a moment so last time we used some really cheap pots to try and do feedback control. We found even reading that data was quite jittery. So first of all, I'm gonna try a higher quality pot, which is branded and costs 10 times as much. And then we're gonna try some actual digital encoders, which are magnetic. So here's the pot I was using. It cost 99p from eBay. It's a 10K linear pot. We found the data that came out was quite jittery. We've got screens, cables and things, but even without the motor powered up, so there's no interference at all, we found that data was quite jittery with the analog ins. And this uh, Teensy has 13 bit analog ins. So first of all, I'm gonna try this, which is a Vichy branded pot. It's actually a 10 turn pot that turns around 10 times. Uh, which isn't what I meant to buy, but nonetheless it is. It's wire wound. This one costs £12, so over 10 times as much. So we're going to see if the data that comes out or at least the analog signal is any more stable and try and solve that. A 10 turn pot might be quite useful and I'll discuss that shortly. So I've just wired up my pot to the Teensy analog in. I've still got the original pot from last time, which is still connected for comparison. And I'm just doing a serial read there and um, writing both those values out to the serial terminal. So we can see pretty much straight away there's just as much jitter actually. That's not much better um, uh, between the two. So the more expensive pot, there's still quite a few issues there. I don't know if there's, no, it probably looks about the same to be honest. Obviously this one's got quite a lot of resolution because it turns around 10 times. And as I said, we'll talk about how that's useful in a moment. Uh, but there is just as much jitter. But it's something we could filter out, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's slightly less, whether the other one's jittering more. There's really not much in it if that's the case. Um, I tried looking in a serial plotter and it's not much easier to say. So yeah, we could filter that out digitally and we could take a running average or something like that, whether it would be less accurate. But if we only use it on power up, is it more or less accurate with the filter than um, hitting a micro switch? So the current homing solution is of course this micro switch and there's a block and then as the ball screw gets to the ends, it hits the micro switch. So, uh, and that's it really. So obviously that's quite awkward to do without the dog on the stand. So what we could do of course is get a 10 turn pot, pot and put it on the ball screw um, and that would be very lovely other than the 10 turn pot's only 10 turns and the ball screws are 1605 which means it's 16 millimeters in diameter and 5 mil thread pitch so each rotation basically moves it 5 millimeters and that means with a 10 turn pot we could only measure 50 millimeters of travel so what we need to do really for the entire length of this ball screw is somehow put this next to the pulley uh, with another pulley 
or gear it down on another three to one. So then we get 150 millimeters of travel. There's of course space here and there's space at the other end. So it's not a terrible solution to just have 10 turn pots with a gear ratio straight on the ball screw. What we could really do is a proper linear pot, of course, like in calipers, which are capacitive. And that's um, obviously a very accurate measurement on um, a linear slide as long as you like. You can buy pots like that, but they're very expensive. I mean, these calipers are 30 or 40 pounds each. And remember, I've got to do 12 axis. So um, that's going to soon add up. But what's better than 12 analog pots on 12 analog in pins with really long wires and all that trouble? Well, I've got here is a digital magnetic encoder. And now this is an AMS AS5048A variety of the uh, device, which cost about the same as the pot. I think it was about £12 or $12. So uh, it's not going to break the bank. It comes on a board with a breakout with lots of pins and it also comes with a magnet uh, which is supposed to sit over it and rotate. Now this is a 14-bit sensor so we've got um, a, a lot better resolution than the 13-bit analog in in any case and this particular one is an SPI version so the B variety if you buy the 5048B that one is I squared C. Now there's a library for the I squared C version from SOS Android uh, which is quite comprehensive and also allows reflashing the I squared C address. It's permanent, but that means I could address 12 of them with individual addresses. Now, there is one for the SPI version from Zootrope Labs, um, but that does not allow readdressing, although you can daisy chain according to the data sheet, the SPI version. But I don't know if that library actually supports daisy chaining. And the reason I've got the A variety and not the B variety, I would have bought the I squared C one I could readdress, is that I couldn't find any stock at the time and had to get it in time for the video. Uh, now going back on DigiKey or somewhere, there's actually loads of the B variety in stock. Um, this also supports PWM out, which of course I can read on the Teensy, because the Teensy has lots of digital pins and everyone has an interrupt. So you'd have no problem reading 12 of them with PWM. But for now we're just going to test if the data is stable. So I've mounted one of these on a little 3D printed board. It's got a little top that goes on like that. And then I've mounted the magnet, it's just a push fit in another 3D print. And I'm assuming this magnet is polarised that way rather than that way. So that we get the north and south rotate round that way. And that should fit neatly in there. I need to screw this on and that should give us just the right height. So the magnet needs to be between half a millimetre and three millimetres from the sensor. And then we can just rotate it round and we can see how stable that data is. So I'm using the SPI um, example. I'll put all the links in the description. And I've just made one modification, which is to map the value from 14 bit, um, which gives a maximum value of 16,383 down to 10 bit. Um, and when I open a COM port, you'll see why that is. So the first column is the raw encoder data. The middle column is the 10 bit value. So we've lost some bits there. And um, obviously the last value there is the angle. So if I turn my orange knob there, we can see those values changing. So we should be able to turn it all the way up to 16,383, just about before it wraps over. Uh, the middle value of course goes up to 1,023 as it would with an analog pot. And the other one is the actual angle that goes up to 360. So um, with there's still some jitter there at the 14-bit value. And of course, the jitter in the final column is in tenths of a degree. Uh, but of course, this 10-bit value, it didn't stay stable at 11-bit even. But um, the 10-bit value is rock solid. And that's pretty good. So compared to a 10-bit analog pot read into an Arduino, I'm using an Uno here because it doesn't really matter. Um, obviously, the Teensy's got 13-bit, but then we still see more jitter on there. So... That's actually a really rock solid value. Um, obviously, the magnet has to be aligned. If you wiggle the magnet, you can make the, val the value wiggle. But if you leave it well alone, then um, that value is pretty good and it stays pretty rock solid. So that's actually a pretty useful device. And I really like the way that it's so compact. So compared to a pot, which obviously you've got like the nut and the body you have to attach, and then you have to attach that to something and hold that and turn it. This is quite a lot bigger. So I quite like the flatness of this really, even in this overkill package, obviously the device is tiny. Um, that will be very much easier to integrate into the ends of joints. Um, and so it's less bulky. Yeah, it's much easier to accommodate something flat, perhaps even built into the aluminium here on the knee perhaps and the shoulder there where we've got plenty of space to um, redesign that rather than having to stick a pot you know on the outside with another mount 
Um, so much easier, quite like these. I think these are going to be used in lots of other projects. So just to reiterate what happens now, we've got a master Arduino Mega that controls the kinematic model and everything else, and then that's linked to two slave Arduinos, and that's because those between them have enough serial ports to talk to six O drives. But they also deal with the homing sequence, that so homes the ball screws to their micro switches, it then reads back the O drive encoder position and takes that off all future commands. So that basically deals with the offset. If I reflash the master controller as I'm making it work through trial and error, then the others don't get rebooted and they remember that offset. So eventually we'll get that ability to home and remember the offset in the O drive firmware, but it's not there now. So what I was trying to solve was having absolute position encoders we can read on every reboot of the master controller so that we can maintain that position. But there might be an easier solution to this. So as it's been pointed out, we could write that value once we've once we've done the homing to some RAM or something else, we could just send it by serial to another Arduino that's just sat there on the side and read it back after the reboot. And obviously we can have a flag set that if we've never written a value since power up, we need to do the calibration sequence. So that would work just as well. But there might be an even easier solution. So let's talk about these axes which are underneath here. So there is a home switch on here, but I haven't actually haven't been homing these for a very long time uh, because it's quite inconvenient because it makes the whole leg tilt in or out. Um, so what I've just been doing is setting these axes up by manually rolling the motor until this is parallel with this counterpart which is fixed and then powering on the O drive and then the O drive remembers that as its zero position. So, um, and that works quite well, it doesn't matter what happens because it never has to remember any offset because the O drive always keeps a zero from when it's powered up, which was in the correct place in the first place. So of course we could do the same for these, we could just drive the motors to a known position, perhaps till the micro switch goes click, and then we could power on the O drive and then we could say that's zero. So instead of actually driving the motors with the motor driver and encode to home and remember the position, uh, we could just power them on in the right place and say that's zero. And then the O drive would always remember that as zero and we'd have no problems. So that wouldn't help me of course with powering on in an unknown state if you just threw the robot down powered off and then you powered it on and it had to discover where all its legs are and what angle it's at and then put itself straight. But for now I can actually continue uh, with the testing and try to make it walk properly, which means that it's probably time to tear out the electronics, take all those Arduinos out and put the Teensy in. Before I do that, and for the rest of this video, we're actually gonna deal with the hardware upgrades I mentioned last time. So the first hardware upgrade is dealing with the encoder mount, which you can see here, and it's currently a 3D printed block of plastic with a piece of M8 studding glued in it. And that's because there is a mount for the back of the motor because they're drone motors for a propeller or whatever, or a push-pull configuration. Uh, but basically this thing is 10 millimeters and it doesn't fit into the biggest adapter for that encoder, which is eight millimeters. So currently it's sitting on studding. This thing's really wobbly and rides in and out on the thread. There is a bearing in this block as well, uh, but that's really unreliable. So there's also a little bit of blue tape to pack out the M8 studding because it's not quite eight millimeters. So I'm gonna get these turn them down in the lathe that I've got now and put the proper metal mounts on. So this is the Axminster C1 micro engineering lathe. So that should now fit perfectly on an eight millimeter internal diameter bearing, and that's how we know it's tolerance properly. So, yep, seems like a pretty good fit. So that should fit both the bearing in the block and also fit the encoder mount. Yep, so that's all 12 of them. So now time to get them fitted. So that's the new mount fitted there, and that's the old one. So hopefully this one should be a lot truer and spin on center better. And uh, obviously this one's not very accurate and the studding is not even in there straight. So you can see the motor's now running in the bearing on the encoder mount. And then we use a plastic spanner thing that comes with the encoder as a spacer to slip over the adapter for an 8mm shaft. Then that black thing that pushes over tight. And then the encoder fits over both of them and that should screw on where it was before. Like so. And that should be a really good mount. So the only other issue to solve is that this is uh, quite wobbly because the mount is quite long and eventually, um, especially when it had thread there, it would ride up and down and push that push fit thing off. So I've made a little piece that fits in here that's just going to glue in and hold this together to make sure this always stays in the same place. Next upgrade is aluminium pulleys in place of the 3D printed ones and these ones have two grub screws each 
to stop them slipping on the shafts. So those are fitted on all of the 12 axis and they look a lot better and they feel a lot more solid and I'm pretty sure those aren't gonna slip. So now it's time to sort out the looseness we've got in the knee there. So that's a combination of the rose joints being loose. They're actually got the studding glued in, even though there should be a nut on there really. Um, but there's still quite a lot of play and also we've just got a 10mm bolt shoved in a hole here to make the joint. So I'm going to sort out a redesign for the knees. So Iger sent me some of their high quality polymer rose joints which are an incredibly high density polymer. They've got a metal insert and they're really high tolerance and very tight indeed. They come with an integrating nut you snap off to lock them in place. So again I've got these on 10mm studding. Have a look at the Igus website, there's lots of different options. And I've redesigned and reprinted the knees. So instead of a piece of studding just going for a hole, we've now got this slot. So as you do up the M4 bolts onto the um, 4020 extrusion there, actually it's gonna clamp that piece in place. So that should make it much better and much less loose than it is now. So that new piece is fitted. You can see there we've got that slot that's been compressed down to hold the bolt that's in there. So now we've got quite a rigid leg there. This is the old knee and you can see that studding is um, quite loose and rattly in the hole there and there's nothing really holding it. At least this one has got nuts either side doing it up, but this one, the nuts and bolts on the outside of the aluminium, so that didn't help really to make the joint any more solid. And of course I've got those new rose joints fitted to all of the rods, top and bottom of the leg, so the whole leg um, is much, much more rigid. There's no rattling and nothing nasty going on there. These are also quite heavy chunks of metal because the ends are actually steel on these and of course these weigh a lot more than the new ones. So hopefully I've taken off at least as much weight by putting the new rose joints on than I've put on with the pulleys, which are aluminium. The other curious thing I've discovered is that these are actually uh, not the same length as what I specified in the kinematic model, which is why I've had some issues with the knees cracking and the feet trying to scrape on the floor in certain moves basically because the maths is right but the robot is still wrong. So now I've put the new rods on, I've measured them much more accurately or at least made them the right length. So um, hopefully our kinematic model will work properly when we power it up. It's also worth mentioning again that this is a traditional rigid robot. This is not gonna be as compliant and as dynamic as the Boston Dynamics robots, apart from the fact that I'm not as good as Boston Dynamics. I did look at a springy robot leg with an elastic tendon that's force controlled. So it's worth having a look at that video for the discussion about the differences. And also of course the force control robot gripper. And I'll be going on to make an entire force control compliant robot arm. So that's all for this episode. Next time I'm gonna be coming back to do the electronics, of course, getting rid of those Arduinos and basically putting that Teensy in on one card, hopefully in our slot system with proper electronics and connectors and all the good things. So don't forget to check back next time for more updates. All right, that's all for now.